Okay, in order to understand what happens while we walk and run, um, the gait cycle has been divided into different phases. Stance phase is when we're on the ground. Swing phase is when the leg is going through the air. If you look at this in an image in front of you, during contact period, you'll notice that the knee is relatively straight while walking. And when you go into your mid-stance period, the knee is also straight. And what happens is that your center of mass, the center of mass is the center of your pelvis. If you were to flip a body in the air and you notice where the center, the center point of rotation is, that's called the center of mass. In the human body, it's just in front of the sacrum. And the center of mass, the pathway that it moves through space, um, varies between walking and running. And there, it's a very big distinction. A lot of people will differentiate walking, the gait cycle with walking, from the gait cycle with running by saying running occurs once we go airborne. That um, when no, neither foot is on the ground, you have a brief airborne phase, that's the moment that we begin to run, but that's incorrect. The most slower runners, the vast majority of like 12 and 13 minute mile runners um, do not have an airborne phase. And walking is distinguished from running by the location of the center of mass. If you look in this picture, during mid-stance, the center of the mass of the body of the pelvis is at a high point, but uh, during double limb support, in this picture where propulsion is, the center of mass is at a low point. So uh, you create this graph where center of mass is high mid-stance, low double limb support, and there is very little energy expenditure. Most of the tendons absorb energy, the knee is locked, so there's no caloric expense. And what happens is that with a locking of the joints, stiffness of the structures, the tendons store and return free energy. If you look at running, the contact mid-stand cycles are greatly reduced, but the propulsive period is extended. What's important about this image and really what defines running is that the center of mass, if you look at the second picture from the left, the center of mass is at a low point during mid-stands and a high point as they go into the propulsive period and the propulsive period is greatly extended. Stride lengths also vary. Um, uh, the stride length with running can be over 11 and a half feet long. That is longer than the stride length of a comparably weighted quadruped. Um, with uh, the discussion of efficiency, what makes a good runner? A lot of people will tell you it's specifics in form, it's specifics in alignment, it's how you hold your hands. But the real answer comes down to an article that was written in 1953 for the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Um, the most efficient gait is the one in which the least energy is expended moving the center of mass through space. And if you look at the picture on top, it's a stick figure analogy. That is stiff-legged. You'll see the center of mass go up and down with large transitions, single limb support. The center of mass is at an, a high point. Glute medius is um, functioning to keep that pelvis high. The pelvis is level. If you go to the image just below it, they bring in pelvic rotation, lengthens the stride a little bit, and you get a flattening of the center of mass. When you have too many curves in the center of mass, muscles have to work too hard to accelerate forces up and decelerate them as they return. So the, the metabolic cost goes up a little bit. Subtle changes in stride length, subtle changes, not in stride length, but in pelvic rotation, knee flexion. They're called determinants of the gait cycle. Saunders, Inman, and other researchers came up with a series of determinants that improved efficiency during the gait cycle. For example, look at the top picture here. What you'll see is that when the pelvis is held in a perfectly level position on the top, glute medius has to work a little bit too hard. Center mass goes up and down a little bit more. The metabolic cost of moving the center of mass goes up and you end up with a less efficient gait. If you go to the second row there, you'll see a dropping of the left hip. Glute medius is lowering the pelvis just a little bit. That alters, it flattens that pathway out a little bit, which improves efficiency. The very bottom illustration shows a stiff knee gait. Notice that um, center of mass moving through a very defined arc. A little bit of knee flexion in that lower picture flattens that pathway, smooths the caloric expense of raising and lowering it. So pelvic rotation in the frontal plane, knee flexion in the sagittal plane are very important. This was from Inman Ralston and Todd's book on human walking, great book. Um, it talks about ankle kinematics altering the progression of the center of mass. And in this illustration, if you look at the top of the hip through the illustrations, you'll notice that there's a certain up and down motion which is metabolically very expensive 
ankle kinematics in the lower illustration. Tibialis anterior is lowering the front of the ankle. That brings the ankle down. That helps to uh, flatten the center mass a little bit. And then as you go into your propulsive period, the ankle plantar flexes, plantar flexes again flattens progression of the center of mass, essential for efficient running. Now, given everything that I just said, you would assume that the most efficient gait would be one with a perfectly flat center of mass. The classic example of that is um, Groucho running. If anybody has seen the comedian Groucho Marx, when he does that classic bent knee walk holding a cigar, you can look it up on YouTube. Um, a, a famous researcher, Tom McMahon from Harvard, showed that that style of gait where he flattened his center of mass so it formed a perfect line um, produced, resulted in a 50% increase in oxygen consumption. That's because when you're, all the joints are bent too much and the whole structure, the center mass, the progression of it is perfectly flattened, um, it is too expensive to keep it flat. It explains why on a gram per gram basis, a mouse consumes 20 times more energy than a pony. It also explains why elephants are so metabolically efficient. They keep their knees straight and use other motions to just moderately flatten the center of mass. When it comes to running, um, the most efficient progression of the center of mass is avoiding excessive displacement, but not flattening it completely. A couple of researchers from Cornell wanted to figure out which pattern of movement, walking and running, which pattern of locomotion was most efficient. So they created a computerized model where they put in every possible determinant and evaluated the metabolic cost. This was an important paper, it never got read, it was published in the journal Nature, short, very technical, but it showed that on the extreme ends of locomotion, um, walking slowly and fast running, that first gait with slow walking, relatively stiff-legged gait, center mass going high, pelvis going high, that that was efficient. At the very extreme ends, running, that high, that uh, uh, impulsive running, conventional running, where you had long stride lengths, you were airborne for long periods of time, it was metabolically moderately expensive, but you covered long distances, again, stride lengths of over 11 feet. But what they showed for the vast majority of runners, the vast majority of bipeds in the middle of that graph, a type of running called hybrid running was the most metabolically efficient. And in my opinion, it's what most recreational runners intuitively do, especially like the 10 and 11 minute milers. It's basically a combination, they called it inverted pendular running. It's a combination of walking and running where you don't have big fluctuations in the center of mass. With running, the center of mass is low during mid stance. With walking, it's high. Instead of having big fluctuations like that with hybrid running, you have a stiff knee gait so that when your foot first hits the ground, you have a brief, if you look at that lower picture on the right side, you have a slow drop of the center of mass, but then with the stiff knee, the center of mass comes up a little bit. It flattens it a little, but not too much. And then it repeats that cycle. It basically is a cross between walking where a stiff leg produces um, large fluctuations in the location of the center of mass and, and running where the center of mass drops. Center mass is more level. I'll do an example of it in a little while um, where we go over the different styles. In order to determine, in order to evaluate what happens with walking, hybrid running, and running, we're going to do a treadmill example where I put someone on a treadmill and we just look at what happens when um, we start up the treadmill. So in this example, we're going to show exactly what happens at different speeds of locomotion. Um, so we're going to start with a very slow walk. So if you could just hit the speed belt and you'll notice once the gate, once the belt starts going, Levi's going to transition into um, just a conventional walk. We had talked about straight legged, um, center mass goes high during single limb support, knees are relatively locked, uh, energy is being absorbed at the hips. Ankle plantar flexion in the front uh, during push-off, um, ankle plantar flexion rather during contact, uh, plantar flexion during push-off um, will level the pelvis as we push through um, different components. Again, the main thing you want to look at is that the knees are straight, center of mass is high as the speed increases a little bit. Uh, Levi's length of stride stays the same and for metabolic efficiency, he's going to increase his cadence a little bit, increase his speed a little bit more. 
So every few seconds, just increase it slightly. So again, cadence is going up. You see a quicker turnover of the hips. Each lower extremity weighs about 20 pounds. It's metabolically expensive to um, increase the cadence because the hip flexors and extensors have to slow, ac accelerate, and decelerate. So at, everybody has a different point. It's called the transition speed. He's still walking at a, a relatively quick pace. Um, cadence is getting faster and faster. And everybody has a different transition point, And it's just about to happen. Each person at a different speed He's doing a faster than a 15 minute mile here. He's still walking. And right here he's transitioning at, it's a little bit faster than a 15 minute mile. Transitioning, keep it at that pace for a second. Transitioning into a slow run. Um, center of mass, now is at this speed, it's kind of a hybrid run at this point. Knees are relatively straight. Center mass isn't fluctuating that much. The transition from a walk to a slow run is very interesting. For decades, people argued, everybody transitions. If I put 100 people on this treadmill and hit a speed at a different point, everybody would have a different speed in which they transition from a walk to run. It was argued forever, and then some great research was done, and you can slow it down just a hair. Some great research was done where they measured um, EMG activity, the gastrocnemius muscle, and compared it to force output beneath the forefoot. And they showed that early research where they just looked at EMG activity showed that when the leg was behind you, the stride length opened, your gas rock was firing via EMG vigorously. And they said, well, it, it's not to reduce stress on the gas rock because the gas rock is still functioning perfectly. But when they compared EMG activity to force plate analysis of data from the forefoot, what they showed was the gas rock was firing like mad at that transition speed, the walk to run transition speed, but at a, the exact moment that people converted to running, the force output dropped markedly. And what the researchers concluded was that EMG readings are not that accurate an output of, of muscle force. Um, muscles are made of actin and myosin filaments, and when a muscle gets really stretched, the muscle filaments are barely in contact, so you end up with a, a, a weakness, even though the EMG was extremely active, gastrocnemius became so weak, you couldn't perpetuate that length of stride and that cadence, so people transitioned into a, a, a hybrid run. And as we go faster and convert to a regular run, notice at this point, he's doing a heel strike. At slow speeds of running, heel strikes are 50% more efficient. At a 730 mile pace, they are about six or seven percent more efficient. Um, and what happens is, as we transition into the higher speed center mass, now you can clearly see center mass is dropping, knees are flexing a little bit more, the heel strike pattern is starting to vary. He's going, as this goes faster, he's gonna go to more of a midfoot strike. Again, faster speeds are necessary for mid. So at this, at this pace now, he's just a, a classic midfoot. This runner is a sprinter, so mid and forefoot strikes are more comfortable for him. But the purpose of this treadmill experiment was to show that everybody has a preferred transition speed. It's based on gastrocnemius output. Choice of heel strike or forefoot strike or contact points in general vary with speed. The same runner who's a heel striker at a slow speed can be a forefoot striker at a fast speed. And, uh, and this is some great research. Tim Anderson is a phenomenal exercise physiologist. He showed that if you notice the stride length that he's picking, everybody picks a stride length that is metabolically most efficient for them. When you're looking at a runner attempting to change stride length, right now thousands of things are happening in the central nervous system. He's evaluating the metabolic cost of gluteus medius activity, the metabolic cost of peroneal activity, metabolic cost of quadricep flexion, and he is going to come up with a formula that works for him to determine which length of stride works the best. So no matter what any coach tells you, people self-select the metabolically most efficient stride length. Almost always attempts to modify a stride length result in decreased efficiency. Now that you've seen the differences between um, walking, slow running, and fast running, I wanted to talk about um, a, an area that's been getting a lot of interest lately, just how do you pick uh, a contact point? 
and despite the fact that the majority of slow runners in instinctively strike the ground with their heel, there is a growing trend in the running community to have all athletes switch to a midfoot strike pattern. The mid and forefoot strike pattern is theorized to improve shock absorption and enhance the storage and return of energy. Midfoot strike patterns at faster speeds have been shown to lessen um, retro patellar forces by as much as 50%. And the reason for that is that the gastrocnemius with a forefoot strike pattern absorbs force instead of the knee. You, when it comes to modifying your gait, um, you can't, there's no one gait that is better than another. You can't absorb shock better with one gait than another. You just switch the location that you absorb the force. When you have a heel strike, your tib anterior and your knee are absorbing the force. When you have a mid or a forefoot strike, your gastrocnemius is uh, absorbing the force. There's several epidemiological studies incorporating more than 1,600 recreational runners conclude no difference in injury rate between rear foot and forefoot strikes. Um, a lot of people will reference a paper that just came out recently showing that runners that, it was a study of Harvard, Division I runners, they showed that the runners with the midfoot strikes had 50% reduced injury rates compared to the runners with the heel strikes. It also goes back to a study of the world's best runners at a half marathon in um, Japan. The world's fastest runners, a larger percentage of them were midfoot strikers, but still the majority were heel strikers. The problem with the study that I just talked about with the Harvard um, runners was that they, these athletes self-selected their midfoot strike patterns. If you self-select a strike pattern, chances are it's going to be more efficient for you. They did not measure foot architecture. They did not measure ranges of motion. They just evaluated injury rates. In my experience, some of the, the athletes with midfoot strike patterns tend to have neutral arches, good ankle ranges of motion, wide forefeet. They tend to be um, just very good athletes in general. You rarely see people with tight calves and low arches becoming midfoot strike pattern the midfoot strikers. If you transition a self-selected rear foot striker, especially the slow ones, to a, a forefoot strike, you can get into trouble. And one of the main differences is energy absorption. Um, if you have a heel strike, a guy named Hasselman did a beautiful study and he showed the tibialis anterior is beautifully designed for absorbing shock during the gait cycle. Within a physiological range of motion, it is impossible to injure it. It is ex extremely powerful. It tr absorbs force by slowly lowering the forefoot to the ground. The calcaneus is also beautifully designed for handling the stresses of hitting the ground. A 100-pound female has the same size calcaneus as a 350-pound gorilla. And um, the calcaneus is unusual in that it has a beautifully designed fat pad beneath it, which I'll get into in a second and it has a very thin cortical bone so it can compress easily. Um, one of the most important things when you're talking about the transition to a forefoot strike pattern is that if you have a runner switch to a forefoot strike, gastrocnemius has to work at greater force. Um, now, if we're looking here, this athlete is naturally prefers a midfoot strike. He's a sprinter or forefoot strike, but at this slow speed, he's hitting the ground on his heel. And that's what a lot of research is showing. People, the same runner who says that they're a midfoot striker will, when you watch them at one speed, will be a heel striker and at another speed be a forefoot striker. Half the time people don't even know their strike pattern. So telling all athletes, especially slow ones, that they should transition into a midfoot strike is injurious. And in some great research um, on efficiency, especially um, uh, gastrocnemius, Gastrocnemius, I'm going to come to a study right here. Gastrocnemius is an interesting muscle. When you switch to a four-foot strike, and let me have you go a little bit faster on the treadmill. So now he's naturally transitioning into more of a mid-foot strike pattern. Gastrocnemius is normally active only during the contact period. When you switch to a mid-foot strike pattern, it is active during contact and mid-stance. By being active during contact, you are doubling the effective workload on it. And in this paper that I have hidden right here uh, by Hasselman, they showed that muscles that cross two joints are architecturally unstable. They break more readily, they are more prone to eccentric damage, you get more delayed onset muscle soreness with them, 
and a great study of ultra marathon runners who um, self-select midfoot strike patterns. They measured muscle enzyme levels. Their creatine kinase levels were through the roof, and it was because gastrocnemia is, is it breaks down more. Tibialis anterior, you could work all day without having it break down. Um, and in this next slide, what I'm gonna talk about is when his foot hits the ground at this faster speed, what's happening is at heel strike or at, at foot strike, the, the force travels through the tibia at 200 miles per hour. They've embedded, embedded accelerometers in the upper and lower tibia. And upon heel strike, the tibia was shown to vibrate at 40 cycles per second. So we're just gonna have you slow that down. So to summarize the differences between mid uh, forefoot and heel strike, um, runners who strike the ground with their forefeet absorb more force at the ankle and less at the knee. And the opposite is true of heel strikers. Um, the choice of striking on the midfoot or rear foot doesn't alter overall force present during the contact period. It just transfers the force to other joints and muscles. People who land on their midfoot absorb the force in their gastrocnemius with a significant reduction in uh, retropatellar pressure. People who strike the ground with their heel absorb the force with tibia anterior, which is well designed to tolerate that force, but transfer more pressure, more force into the back of the knee. An interesting study was published by Altman and Davis. They wanted to evaluate uh, mid, uh, the effect of midfoot strike on tibial stress fractures. The belief, and it's a logical belief, is that if you land on your midfoot, you will lessen the intensity of force traveling through the tibia. It lessens pressure in the patella by 50%, so it should lessen um, pr pressure on the tibia. Tibial, tibial fractures are the most common stress fractures present in the running community. More than 40% of all fractures are tibial fractures. They are extremely difficult to treat. They're hard to figure out exactly what's going on. So these researchers did a wonderful study where they created, used CAT scans to design personalized strain gauges that were fitted to the legs of subjects as people um, ran in different test conditions. Rear foot strike while wearing a running shoe, four foot strike while wearing running shoes, and while running barefoot. What the researchers were expecting was that a four foot strike would markedly lessen that impact force on the tibia and reduce stress. Again, when your foot hits the ground, the force travels through the tibia at 200 miles an hour, creating a bending force capable of fracturing bone. The uh, oscillations are 40 cycles per second. And what this study found was that when people landed with their midfoot while wearing shoes or with, uh, landed on their forefoot while wearing shoes, what they noticed was that there was a significant increase in bending force on the tibia. The tibia actually bent more than it did when there was a heel strike. Um, and when people ran barefoot, the foot hit the ground in more of a neutral position. It wasn't as plantar flex. So when they, people were wearing the minimalist shoes, their ankles were as plantar flex, 10 to 15 degrees. And that in turn, when their heel lowered to the ground, created tension in the soleus muscle that pulled back on the tibia with so much force that the tibia started to bend. There was actually more bending stress on the tibia with a minimalist shoe um, forefoot strike um, than there was with a heel strike. That was, people weren't expecting that because when you think of impact problems, when you think of trauma to bones, you tend to think of just impact forces traveling through the lower extremity. Uh, researchers shouldn't have been too surprised by it um, because what, uh, what they've known from the rowing community is that rowers tend to create fractures along their lower ribs where their serratus anterior matches against their external oblique. They pull with so much force that multiple ribs can crack at the same time because of intrinsic force created by muscle activity. The same thing happens in the fibula. Uh, the fibula at the interface between peroneus longus and brevis, the fibula can crack at the interface between the muscles because the muscles do opposing actions. So what happened um, with this study and why it was particularly interesting was that the, the barefoot runners struck the ground with almost their foot in neutral. They absorbed the, the shock pretty well. As Soon as they had perceived comfort, as soon as they had perceived protection, they struck the ground with a greater degree of ankle plantar flexion, which increased the bending stress placed on the tibia. So again, it was kind of unfortunate because it means in order to reap the benefits of barefoot running, you really have to be barefoot. Cushioning the shoe or putting any protection on it at all produces an altered gait pattern.
foot strike and metabolic efficiency. Again, just to summarize, walkers are 53% more efficient with a heel strike. Um, that makes it very comfortable for slow runners to continue to use their heel. Cunningham did that study in 2010. That's a huge difference, and it's the reason that recreational runners with a comfortable heel strike should not be told to transition to a midfoot strike unless they have serious um, patellofemoral pain. As far as when you lose that ability to be efficient, um, some nice research, Miller did a study and showed that at a 636 mile, minute per mile pace, heel striking was still 6% more efficient. So it's, it's gradually catching up. Most experts are saying once you hit the six minute mile pace, the transition there is no difference. And that gets into that study of elite Japanese runners that once you look at the elites running sub six minutes, you know, five and a half minute miles, there's no difference in efficiency and people will choose a pattern based on their own architectural alignment. In my experience, people with wide forefeet, no history of Achilles, good plantar fascia, good arches, do better with midfoot strikes. People with low arches, narrow forefeet, tight gastrox, do better with heel strikes. Um, and this is a study by Delgado. I put this in here because it was just a questionnaire. Do you feel more comfortable with a midfoot strike pattern um, uh, or a heel strike pattern? Recreational runners, uh, almost can, all of them said that at slower speeds, the rear foot strike pattern is rated as significantly more comfortable. This is important because when you transition an athlete into a minimalist shoe, the belief is that they'll naturally switch to a four-foot strike um, and they're, therefore absorb shock a little bit better, lessen pressure. But worst case scenario is you put them in something that doesn't protect their heel and then they continue to strike the ground on their heel because they're metabolically more efficient and it's just comfortable. Again, tip anterior is great at absorbing shock. In this study, they looked at, uh, they noticed that 35% of recreational runners transitioning into the middle, minimalist footwear continued to strike the ground in spite of the amplified impact forces. Heel striking is just too uh, efficient to give up. Uh, we were meant to strike on the calcaneus. The evolution of the calcaneus is unusual. I mentioned it during the gait examination. The calcaneus is, um, a human calcaneus is larger than the calcaneus or heel bone of a 350 pound gorilla. Um, laser analysis of all the homo erectus footprints ever found, every single one of them showed a heel strike. Uh, if we were born to run, there would have been one footprint now found in which the initial point of contact was the forefoot. Um, the uh, heel pad beneath the fat pad is unusual. It contains 4.5 times more polyunsaturated fat than any other fatty tissue in the body. Um, that allows it to function at sub-zero temperatures with no change in its ability to absorb shock. It also contains these connective tissue elastic walls. If you look at the picture on the left, those are all sealed containers of elastic fibers with polyunsaturated fats. It absorbs, absorbs force 2.1 times better than sorbothane. In fact, when your foot hits the ground with a heel strike, 19% of the forces associated with heel strike are absorbed in the first 150 milliseconds. Again, there isn't a material made that even comes close. Dissections of the calcaneal fat pad show that there are two separate pads, a macro chamber and a micro chamber. The micro chamber is a surrounding chamber that allows, um, uh, it basically acts as a mushroom that it's a cup that holds the macro, the, the deeper macro chamber. Um, the macro chamber deforms significantly and returns some of the energy. The micro chamber stays intact. Um, that the macro chamber, again, it's unusual in that it even has, a guy named Bone just showed that it has a ligament on the medial side so that when your foot hits the ground on the outside of your foot and your foot pronates, the medial restraining ligament keeps that fat pad in place. If we really were designed to have midfoot strike patterns, we wouldn't have that fat pad just glued down on one side. And now this, if you haven't seen this paper, it came out in 1995. It, it, to me, it was one of the more important papers on muscle function. It showed the tibialis anterior is impervious to injury. It's almost impossible to hurt this muscle when it's functioning in a neutral zone. If someone's complaining of uh, anterior compartment pain, nine times out of 10, it's extensor digitorum longus because that muscle crosses multiple joints. Doing rehab, work the extensor digitorum longus more than the tib anterior. 
Um, and this was repeated stretching through a range with rabbit skeletal muscle, could not damage tibialis anterior. If you've chosen a midfoot strike in which your entire foot hits the ground at the same time, tibialis posterior is important because that's what's going to decelerate the calcaneal eversion. Um, tibialis posterior is a powerful muscle. It comes from the inner osseous septum. It comes between the tibia and the fibula. Extremely important muscle, nine different attachment points. Histological and uh, detailed cadaveric evaluation show that tibialis rotates 45 degrees before it attaches. Midfoot strikes are an excellent way to strike the ground, if, um, especially if you're having uh, proximal injuries. Tibialis, and t uh, tibialis posterior, rather, with that 45 degrees of rotation, actually stores and returns energy in the tendon itself. Um, and it acts like a, a spring to restore that motion. Several other tendons rotate, and I'll talk about that in a second. This is a study by Hasselman that I was talking about. They also evaluated the ability of gastrocnemius muscle to absorb force, and they showed that gastrocnemius, because it crosses two joints, is um, extremely sensitive. It's extremely prone to injury. It's very weak. That's why studies of ultramarathoners show their creatine kinase levels are through the roof, because when you switch to a, a four-foot strike pattern, um, or even a hard mid-foot strike pattern, Gastrocnemius has a double burst in activity. It has to fire during contact period, it has to fire during propulsion, and that increases the potential for delayed onset muscle soreness. If you've got a thick Achilles tendon, if you've got a strong gastroc, it's an option. But keep in mind, gastrocnemius is an unusual muscle. Um, it's, it's, it's relatively weak. This is an interesting study. Um, Wilson wanted to understand what happened in the leg when the foot first hit the ground. So they look to horses. Galloping horses, when they're going full speed, they embedded accelerometers in the leg, and they noticed that the, um, the, the force traveled at a high speed, but more importantly, the bones, when they hit the ground, the tibia, oscillated or vibrated at 40 cycles per second. And they were curious what's, what protected those bones from trauma, what protected those bones from stress fracture, so they took horses and uh, sectioned their flexor digitorum longus muscles. Um, those muscles were believed to be vestigial in horses, remnants of when horses had toes. And flexor digitorum longus and all the distal muscles in, in humans, but flexor digitorum longus in horses is unique. It has these short muscle fibers, half inch long, just that traverse uh, horizontally, but long, long, thin tendons. And they said with such m short muscle fibers, this muscle can't do a thing. This muscle is incapable of producing emotion, and it's just a remnant, like earlobes are remnants. What they discovered was when they cut flexor digitorum longus on the horses, the bones, the tibia, when they hit, oscillated at much higher rates, producing uh, dangerous vibrations. And they realized that certain muscles are designed to dampen vibration. Muscles, when you t typically think about muscles, you think that they accelerate you, they decelerate you. But dampening oscillations with runners is huge in injury prevention. Um, and what this research showed was that a specific muscle function to absorb shock. So a group of other researchers, NIG in particular, took a whole series of athletes, had them run on different surfaces. They varied from extremely hard to extremely soft and measured muscle activity and changes in muscle activity with the uh, belief that they could pick out which muscles were uh, dampeners, which muscles dampen vibration. And what these researchers showed, that when you transition to a hard surface, which your body accommodates within a single step, um, that there's a change in the lateral head of the biceps femoris or the lateral uh, long head of the biceps femoris and the lateral head of the gastrocnemius muscles. So those two muscles are key um, muscles for absorbing shock in humans and uh, different strengthening protocols, different methods of uh, plyometric drills, increasing tones of those muscles, really important for dampening vibrations. And this illustration, as you go farther into the contact period, knee flexion occurs, quadricep is under greater tension, um, significantly more tension, uh, and your body wants to save calories and not spend the energy to dampen, um, to dampen knee flexion. And this was a, a, an MRI study in which they put people in MRIs and they had them flex and extend their leg, calculating the instantaneous axis of rotation. And this was the first paper ever 
that showed the unusual phenomena. When you reach peak knee flexion, 35 or 40 degrees, there's a momentary jump in the location of the axis for sagittal plane motion. The axis jumps 10 millimeters posteriorly. That 10 millimeter jump increases the lever arm to the quadricep, so the quadricep does not have to fire to um, decelerate knee flexion. It, it, it has to fire, but it has a significantly longer lever arm. It's like trying to open a door where you pull farther away. Um, that lever arm reduces strain on the gastroc, decreases uh, uh, metabolic cost of locomotion, and it's instantaneous. Shortly after you reach peak knee flexion, it jumps back. An ultrasonography study of quadricep activity in runners um, or actually in athletes going upstairs showed that the quadricep just before you reach peak force isometrically tenses and the fascia stores and absorbs the energy. That 10 millimeter shift uh, is an, an effective way to lessen the metabolic cost of locomotion. In this next study, in this next image, it was another MRI study and it showed that uh, unlike prior research, there is a vertical axis that travels through the medial femoral condyle. This research showed that the knee behaves as a ball and socket joint on one side, the medial side, and as a gliding joint on the opposite side. It also explained why people get osteochondral fragments with the beginning of arthritis in the medial femoral condyle only. At the exact point that that vertical axis traverses, that's the point that they get arthritis. Um, and internal rotation it allows that forward eight millimeter glide of the lateral femoral condyle. Another important factor with the distribution of pressure um, during the gait cycle is when people are in their mid-stance phase, your contact points of the femur change. If you look at that um, right below patellofemoral shock absorption, the, that's a back view of the patella where it says 20 degrees, that's the contact point, the lower portion of that image. That's the contact point between the femur and the patella when the knee is bent 20 degrees. When you're running, the knee bends to about 40, 45 degrees, and notice the contact points increase, that central contact region. You can have arthritis in the upper portion of the patellofemoral joint. If you have someone switch to a straighter knee gait, you'll be able to unload that portion. So if you've got an MR, if you've got a, a, an x-ray, you're... You can tell on the MRI where um, there's a chondral defect or where there's erosion in the back of the femoral condyle or the patella, rather. You'll be able to modify their gait, transition it around to avoid um, stressing that particular component. I like this uh, particular image because it shows at 90 degrees, a lot of people have erosion on 90 degrees, uh, the upper portion of the patella. Doing squats, which you can go to seven times body weight, can compress that, but the same people can do lunges where they're just bending their knee 45 degrees. And now, during the gait cycle, as you get into the latter portions of the contact period, um, gluteus maximus is an in interesting muscle. If you look at A, its upper fibers um, have a tendency to work in the frontal plane. They stop the opposite pelvis from dropping. Its lower fibers, B, work in the transverse plane. They stop internal rotation from occurring. Um, very important to evaluate the glute max strength, very important to look at that muscle. It's, an, it's probably the most important muscle stabilizing you during um, a running cycle. Interestingly enough, you can be paralyzed in glute max and still be able to walk because you walk with a stiff leg. Gluteus medius controls frontal plane motion of the pelvis. It's when the knee flexes that glute max is important for stability. Um, as we're in the middle of the, the contact period, forces are traveling up and through the hip. We talked about it previously. Piriformis and glute med stop the femoral neck from bending. The upper portion of the femoral neck is, starts to, to shift down. Femoral neck stress fractures in runners are a nightmare to treat. They tend to be recurrent. They tend to take forever to heal. Sometimes you have to have surg surgical fixation to stabilize them. Piriformis strengthening exercises and glute media strengthening exercises um, are f extremely important in stabilizing the femoral neck. Again, femoral neck has no cortical bone on it. We don't need it. As long as you've got a good piriformis, as long as you've got a good uh, gluteus medius, look at that picture of the chimp and Lucy's cortical bone. It's thick. We have none. Um, the shaft of the femur has, is teardrop shaped, powerful. It's exposed to less bending force than the femoral neck. That's how efficient um, piriformis is at stabilizing the femoral neck. If we go up into the sacrum, picture on the left is human sacrum, uh, triangular shape, as opposed to the more rectangular chimp sacrum. Sacrum in humans with the triangular shape has a self-locking mechanism. 
where vertical forces in response to bipedality force it to lock itself down into these um, anominates, creating a more stable structure. If you look at the human SI joint surface area versus chimp, bipedality has forced us to increase the size of the surface area. And in an interesting study, if you look just behind the human SI joint surface area, there's a section of the sacroiliac joint called the interosseous region of the sacroiliac joint. Very few research has ever been done on it. Very few people talk about it. Because you have cartilage on the SI joint, people say, oh, the sacroiliac joint moves until you're in your 70s, 80s, 90s, and SI joints can shift out of position. But one paper evaluated, they did cross-sections through a series of sacroiliac joints, cadaveric study, and they showed that in 60% of 50-year-olds and 100% of 60-year-olds, there is an osseous block the size of your finger that traverses the interosseous region and fuses the joint. So older runners, the clinical implication of this is older runners rarely have sacroiliac problem. Anybody over 60, even if they have cartilage there, that joint's not moving. So tend to look for other things, lumbosacral, piriformis, myofascial. While we're um, running, there's a nice little shock absorber. We talked about how you absorb shock with tibialis anterior if you have a heel strike, tibialis posterior with a midfoot strike. Knee flexion is really important. Some of that shock makes it up into your pelvis. You don't want it going into the back if you can avoid it. So as long as that SI joint is infused, there is a clever mechanism in which when your foot hits the ground, the um, ilium extends, the sacrum rocks forward. It's called sacral mutation. Um, and that allows a natural shock absorption as the vertebral bodies drop. That nutation allows for the storage and return of energy. And it's just one way to lessen the transfer of force into the lumbar spine. Now, Vleeming talks about this. If you look at these illustrations, when you're running, you look at the person on the right, that biceps femoris muscle is under peak tension just before heel strike. Um, it is storing energy that then gets transmitted through the sacrotuberous ligament, traverses into the sacrum, crisscrosses over the multifidus and lumbodorsal fascia, helps to stabilize that whole sacroiliac lumbosacral region, uh, contracture and bicep femoris, contracture the sacrotuberous ligament, can alter that. Um, so if you look at the picture on the left, if Leeming came up with this theory that when your foot hits the ground, um, as the foot pronates, there's a sling between tibialis anterior and peroneus longus. He theorized based on a paper by Close that was written in the 70s that as the fibula dropped down, it pulled the biceps femoris with it. And by pulling the biceps femoris muscle, you stabilize the sacral tuberous ligament and you stop the sacrum from rocking forward. So again, if you just picture biceps femoris here, sacrum starting to rock forward like this, um, that storage of energy was important for uh, dissipating pressure and um, returning some of the energy later in the gait cycle. More recent uh, analyses reveals, uh, Arndt did a couple of papers, reveals the embedded pins in the, all the bones of the lower extremity, fibula, talus, navicular, and they showed that during the contact period, the fibula does not drop. The fibula stays immobile. The fibula drops during the propulsive period when flexor halus longest muscle pulls on the fibula to increase the depth of the ankle mortis. But it just shows that uh, the that belief that the fibula dropping played a role. Um, it, it was disproved not just in this study but another study. Uh, these two studies were interesting in that they measured three-dimensional motion between all the bones of the foot and ankle as people walked and ran. And they actually found that most of the joints move through larger ranges of motion, especially the ankle, when you walked. The clinical implication of this research is that walking is a, it can be harder on the body than slow running. Slow running, especially if you're not doing an excess, is extremely easy on the body. Um, and this study was one of the only ways they could prove that the fibula does not drop during the contact period. Um, as you head into the mid-stance period in running, um, probably the single most important factor is that you've got to take the energy that was absorbed during contact and then apply that, store it temporarily, and return the energy during the push-off phase. You have to also have to protect the bones from bending because you're looking at large forces applied in a brief period of time. Um, and this illustration shows the iliotibial band, which some great new research shows that it doesn't just run on top of the vastus lateralis like people thought. 
It has a series of fibrous slips that envelop the entire outer quadricep muscle and envelop the entire vastus lateralis, wrap around to the back of the femur, and stop the femur from bending. Just like piriformis stops the femoral neck from bending, those deep fibers that wrap around stop the femur from bending. They also showed that the iliotibial band itself, when stretched, had less than a 0.2% ability to elongate. That meant it functioned like a steel cable. It also meant that when you're doing foam rolling, when you're doing massage, you shouldn't be saying, I'm gonna focus on loosening up the band because the author said um, mechanically it's as strong as Kevlar. Loosening up the band is like loosening up a bulletproof vest. It's incapable of elongating and actually works best when it's stiff. So you want a stiff band. What you want to do is loosen the tensor fascia lata, and I'll go into that with some length assessments, and loosen glute max. Those are muscle components that can alter tension. But in this study, if you look at C in this illustration, um, a guy named Chang did a wonderful study where he measured the rate of progression of medial knee arthritis. And especially in bow-legged athletes, the medial side of the knee in a healthy person absorbs about 60% of the force between the two sides. In a bow-legged person, it can absorb 65 or 70% of the force. If you have strong hip abductors, if you're strong in your gluteus maximus and your tensor fascia lata, the band actually pulls up. If you see where that arrow is, the band pulls up, holds the lateral side, and prevents the medial side from compressing like this. What Chang showed was that regardless of the degree of tibio-ephemeral varum, you had less progression of medial knee arthritis when your hip abductors were strong. And that's because tensor fascia lata and glute max can stabilize. Every runner I have who's a little bit bow-legged, I will give them open and closed kinetic chain hip abductor exercises because you've got to keep the hip abductor strong. The iliotibial band, it's not flexible, but it travels down and protects the medial knee and protects the femur from bending. The iliotibial band in histological studies, when I was in school, we were always taught that when the knee hits 28 degrees, the band jumps over the epicondyle and irritates the bursar, and that when you run, as that flexes, it jumps back and forth, back and forth, irritating a bursa. Some great new research, Faircloud did one of the studies, Falvey did another, um, they showed that the band never jumps back and forth and it never irritates the bursa. The band is, is a broad structure, and when you look at a band, when your foot first hits the ground, your tensor fascia lata is under tension a little bit sooner because the leg is straight, and the front of the band pops out like this. And then a second later, as the knee flexes a little bit more, the back of the band pops out. It creates the illusion that the band is snapping back and forth like this, but the band is just pushing in and out like that. They said, the authors of the study said, you gotta stop calling it a friction syndrome. They did MRIs on people with and without um, iliotibial band compression syndromes, and they found that there was no difference in the prevalence of bursitis. Uh, it didn't correlate with the syndrome at all, and they found that there's a deep fibrous slip. So again, just to review this, if you look at the uh, P, uh, uh, the, the figure on the left, A, where that tensor fascia lata is pulling, you can do this on yourself. If you stand up, just bend your knee a little bit, you'll feel the front of the band pop out. Put your finger on the back end of the band, go a little bit deeper, you'll feel the back edge of the back band pop out. Um, it's important because it really changes the way we look at how the band functions. Um, one of the more important things of that study was that the authors discovered a fibrous slip the size of your pinky that attached to the femoral condyle that no one knew was there. And they said it comes along the, the lateral side of the femur and they theorized the mechanism for pain with iliotibial band compression syndrome is not friction over the epicondyle, but it's an enthesopathy a pulling of the distal attachment of that band that attach deep to the regular fibers. Again, um, weakness of the hip abductors can cause the hip to drop, causes the band to pull, can cause all sorts of trouble. In this illustration, um, I wanted to point out that the talus is an extremely unusual bone. The talus is a bone just under the tib and fib. It has no muscles that attach to it. 70% of the talus is covered with cartilage, functions as a frictionless ball bearing. Your lower extremity just slides back and forth over it. Um, a lot of muscles pass by it, but no muscles attached to it. In this illustration, I wanted to get the point across 
the distal muscles and proximal muscles during the gait cycle behave very differently. The proximal muscles are the force generators. When you look at them in anatomical dissections, large massive muscles, tiny little tendons, tons of force output, not a lot of storing and returning of energy there. If you look at all the muscles below the knee, short muscle fibers, long tendons, the tendons stretch to return energy. It's free energy. And if there's one thing you learn from the evolution of bipedality, it was getting farther on few, fewer calories. It's what makes us efficient. So basically, the hips act as, act as motors, the legs as spring, springs. In this analogy, the prosthetic limbs are a perfect example. The modern prosthetic limbs store amazing amounts of energy. They function like tendons. Um, the best example of this is the Achilles tendon. Um, recently, they discovered that the Achilles tendon rotates 90 degrees before it attaches. The tibialis posterior is 45 degrees um, uh, gastrocnemius. The Achilles tendon rotates 90 degrees. And in this study, which I would recommend getting Roberts um, and Wei and uh, they put special sensors inside the gastrocnemiuses of turkeys and then put them on treadmills. There's a great photograph of that. Um, and then they had the, tre the treadmills go on and they measured muscle activity, muscle elongation, and um, tendon motion. And what they discovered, and it applies to humans, is that when you're running, when you're going through the gait cycle, your central nervous system, as the leg is extending behind you, your ankle is dorsiflexing, you're about to go into your propulsive period, your central nervous system senses the angle that you're going to go into your propulsive period, and then just before you do, it isometrically locks down, converting the, the contracture into an isometric contraction. Isometric contractions are extremely efficient. They don't burn calories. The actin and myosin filaments lock on each other, and then the tendon starts to stretch. The tendon, because it has a 90 degree rotation in it, stretches, and then the force gets snapped back. It's free energy. Um, that also, and I'll get into it in a little while, explains why um, a tightness can, uh, can be helpful. Tight people are often metabolically more efficient because they store and return energy in their tendons a little bit better. Um, this illustration, they showed that that rotation of the tendon was vital. Other tendons do it too. Rectus femoris does it. A portion of supraspinatus does it. Um, and as I mentioned, tibialis posterior does it. But it, it gets across that point that muscles isometrically tense and the distal muscles tendon store and return energy. Plantaris, a, a muscle that runs down on the inside, um, uh, starts at the lateral femoral condyle, comes down along between gastroc and soleus, is loaded with proprioceptors, and some people feel that the plantaris muscle plays no role in force generation, but it's loaded with special receptors that will tell your central nervous system exactly when you should convert that gastroc into an isometric contraction, again, to save energy and to improve efficiency. Um, you, you can store energy in the gastroc and the Achilles tendon, um, actin and myosin filament store energy, but you can also store energy in the arch. And a, a great example of this is that the fastest running times happen on tracks that have a little bit of spring to them. Too much spring and you lose efficiency. If you had to run around the edges of a trampoline, you'd spend too much time sinking in, couldn't absorb the energy out. Researchers evaluated tracks to see which tracks produce the best times and they showed that tracks that drop seven to 10 millimeters give you just enough time to store the energy and then it returns it. So most of the world records in track and field can be set on tracks that have a natural spring to them. Um, they did a great study where they embedded uh, ball bearings in the different bones of the midfoot and rear foot and they showed that while running, the arch deflects that same amount. The typical arch lowers about seven millimeters storing energy and returning it. Some of the energy is stored in the tibialis posterior because that tendon rotates 45 degrees and is great for storing and returning energy. Some of the energy is stored in flexion digitorum brevis. Very difficult to say where the energy is stored, but a recent study in which they took calcanei and severed them in half longitudinally showed that all bone spurs form at the attachment of flexor digitorum brevis, not at the attachment of the plantar fascia. So the researchers say flexor digitorum brevis, which runs from the calcaneus to the middle phalanx, is responsible for storing and returning energy. 
um, and functions with the plantar fascia for the preventing excessive displacement of the arch. And again, it's like the trampoline. Too much displacement of the arch and you can become inefficient, a hypermobile flat foot person if forced to run, or anybody with an extremely low arch if forced to run long distances there'd be increased muscle activity. That's why studies on flexibility show really tight people get injured and really loose people get injured because if there's too much flexibility, there's too much muscle strength necessary to stabilize joints. As we go into the propulsive period, and we're going one joint at a time, with that leg behind you, um, uh, someone showed that the tibia, when they measure pressure distribution between the tib and fib, the tibia um, is, supports 83% of the weight of the lower extremity, the fibula only 17%. Most of that 17% is transmitted through the interosseous membrane. Um, during the propulsive period, and I mentioned this a second ago, that flexor hallucis longus, which originates in the middle portion of the fibula, it fires as force is transferred to your big toe. It pulls the fibula down. In that study by Arndt that I measure, measure, mentioned, there's a measurable drop in movement of the fibula during the push-off period. This is essential. It externally rotates and drops inferiorly. It deepens the ankle mortis as forces are peaking. It lessens your potential for an ankle sprain and helps to stabilize the rear foot during push-off. A clever way to protect the ankle and flexor hallucis as long as plays that most important role. And this slide, this was a great study by Neptune et al. And they wanted to figure out, as you go into your propulsive period, what does the soleus do? What does the gastrocnemius do? What roles do they pay, play in the more proximal structures? And what they showed was that, other researchers have shown that the soleus decelerates forward motion of the tibia. So as you're running, that tibia is behind you. Soleus prevents that forward motion. But gastrocnemius, because it's a two-joint muscle, when the ankle plantar flexes rapidly, gastrocnemius causes the knee to flex. If you look and see that arrow, gastrocnemius, when it fires, it drives the knee up and forward. And what Neptune showed was that gastrocnemius is the body's most powerful hip flexor during the initiation of your push-off phase. It's counterintuitive because it's in your foot and your iliopsoas seems like it would be much more efficient. But during push-off, the leg is extended pretty far behind you. Your leverage is reduced. Rectus femoris can work as a hip flexor, or iliopsoas can. But driving that knee up gives all those muscles longer lever arms so that they can function more efficiently. Um, and I'll often treat people with chronic hip flexor problems with gastrocnemia stre strengthening. I'll, I'll check endurance in the gastroc, I'll look for asymmetry, and I'll give them hopping drills, I'll give them bounding drills that can improve efficiency. So gastrocnemia is an unusual muscle. Um, it, it can lessen stress on the hip, it can store and return energy, um, and can be associated with this slide called the Aquinas gate and injury. Um, a guy named Hughes showed that if you had tightness in your gastrocnemius, your heel could leave the ground prematurely, transferring force into the forefoot. There's more stress on the body during the propulsive period, there's more stress on the forefoot during the propulsive period, than there is on the heel during contact because of accelerational forces. You want to accelerate the body forward. If you are, um, if you have less than five degrees of upward motion in the ankle, you have a 400% increased risk of metatarsal stress fractures because that um, early heel lift transitions you into a, a prolonged propulsive period. When you're treating runners with metatarsal stress fractures, most doctors don't even think to look for isolated contracture in the gastrocnemius. Um, the paper below, um, D. Giovanni is an orthopedic surgeon from Rhode Island. Beautiful paper um, showed that isolated contracture of the gastrocnemius muscle not only caused increased potential for metatarsal injuries, it caused more problems with hallux valgus, caused more problems with interdigital neuritis, plantar, caps, plantar plate injuries. Any forefoot injury that you have, lie the patient's spine, check their straight leg range of motion. Um, what D. Giovanni showed was that tightness in the soleus played no role in the development of injuries. Tightness in none of the other muscles, it was isolated contracture of the gastrocnemius. Um, in treating that, in my experience, the medial head of the gastrocnemius responds very well to deep tissue massage, um, uh, followed by muscle energy stretching, prolonged stretches. I'll get into different stretches, toe in stretches, but you've got to remeasure and um, restore motion.
This was a great study published in the Journal of Foot and Ankle Surgery. They wanted to figure out why during the propulsive period so many um, injuries occurred. They wanted to measure bending forces in the metatarsals. They wanted to measure pressure beneath the metatarsal heads. So the researchers embedded strain gauges in the metatarsal shafts and then measured with the uh, pedal barograph pressure beneath the central met heads. Then they attack, attached pneumatic actuator clamps, pushed down on the foot to duplicate the forces of propulsion, and measured bending of the metatarsal shafts and pressure under the metatarsal heads. What these researchers noticed was that as long as they were pulling on the flexor halysis and flexor digitorum longus with the pneumatic actuators, the metatarsals were stable. Um, but what they determined was that as soon as they released that tension, the metatarsal shafts themselves started to buckle like this. And they didn't think about it, but the uh, long digital flexors aren't just necessarily for force production under the toes. They're to protect the metatarsals from fracturing. They're to protect them from bending. It's like having a tree fort where the branch is out and you're building a structure. You put a steel cable from the tree fort to the tree, you can build whatever you want there. You remove that reinforcement, that branch could easily break. That's what flexor digitorum and flexor halysis are. Um, they are powerful stabilizers of the metatarsal shafts. After I read this article, I started treating all my metatarsal stress fracture patients in addition to gastroc stretches with st uh, strengthening exercises for flexor digitorum longus and flexor halysis longus. Outcomes went through the roof. I had one patient who had a series of six metatarsal stress fractures over a two-year period. It kept coming back no matter what was done. She had all localized treatment. Bone density studies were fine. Um, as soon as we strengthened the intrinsics, within uh, like eight to nine weeks, she was able to run and increase mileage. The stress factors never came back. Um, and this, as we go farther into the propulsive period, that's where the windlass effect of the plantar fascia plays an important role. If you look at this picture, as the toe bends, plantar fascia, everybody tends to think of the, the plantar fascia, because it produces heel pain, they tend to think that the plantar fascia gets injured during your contact period. It doesn't. The plantar fascia gets injured during your propulsive period. Um, it gets injured as the toes start to dorsiflex during your push-off period. And what happens with it, just like the iliotibial band is a fiber slip, the plantar fascia is also a fiber slip. Some people have shown also that it has less than a 2% ability to elongate. It functions like a steel cable. When the big toe bends, as the hallux bends, it creates a retrograde compressive force. If you look at C in that picture on the top on the right, which elevates the arch, stabilizes the foot structure, um, and it is reinforced by flexor digitorum brevis. Um, and as the hip is extended behind you, so actually to just get back to this, um, it's load sharing with flexor digitorum brevis. Um, they have shown with plantar fascial problems if you're weak in the toes, you're more likely to develop plantar fasciitis. The, the two structures distribute load evenly, they share the load, and they um, work together in synchrony. If you're weak for whatever reason in flexor digitorum brevis, you will transfer more pressure to the plantar fascia, especially if there's isolated contracture of the gastroc. An early heel lift with weak flexor digitorum brevis is, is really hard on the plantar fascia. It almost guarantees you're gonna have chronic plantar fasciitis. As the hip is extended behind you, I put this picture in to just drive a, a, a across an important point about hip pain during the gait cycle. These two surgeons, Goodard and Gosling, did an interesting study where they embedded special sensors inside the femoral head. And then while they had the sensors in there, they measured pressure inside the femoral head from uh, inter uh, interosseous pressure, and then they surgically sectioned the iliopsoas tendon. And what they showed was that the iliopsoas tendon, if you look at that picture, as it wraps around the femoral neck, it compresses a series of long veins. The front of the femoral neck has a series of long veins that run across, and that pressure from the iliopsoas tendon interrupts the venous drainage. That creates, a, creates a, a backflow of blood into the femoral head. As that backflow increases, pain increases. The degree of osteoarthritis in the hip doesn't correlate with the degree of pain. You, it's, a, it's a common misconception. I, you'll have patients with just a little bit of osteoarthritis and tons of discomfort. What this study showed was that tension in a muscle 
could affect intraosseous pressure, uh, intraarticular hip pressure, because of impaired venous drainage. As a result of this, I have every runner, whether they have hip pain or not, to bore your stretches. Uh, maintaining flexibility of iliopsoas is huge. And then also um, keeping gastrocnemius strong. Remember, gastrocnemius is the most powerful hip flexor. If iliopsoas is being worked because the synergist is weak, that could cause problems. So keeping that hip flexor loose is really important in treating chronic hip pain. As we're going through the rest of the gait cycle, we get into the swing phase. Um, the swing phase is interesting in that it has a brief quiet period in the middle of it, especially when we're walking, where all of your muscles are temporarily paralyzed. Kapanji, not paralyzed, they just shut off, there's no output. Kapanji noted that the hip is still stable even though it lacks any muscular support during mid-swing because the labrum of the hip socket creates a vacuum that even without muscular support, you're not using calories to go through the middle portion of your swing phase. Uh, they did a study in which they took cadavers, drilled holes through the back of the pelvis to go into the acetabulum, and they showed as soon as that hole broke through, um, that hip just popped out of socket. But they could cut all the tendons, cut all the ligaments, and that hip still stayed in socket just from the vacuum phenomena, and it's just one more way that your body saves calories. This illustration right here was important because for 30 years, they argued as to why runners always strain their bicep femoris muscle. You don't, they don't strain their semitendinosus, they don't strain their um, semimembranosus. It's always the long head of the bicep femoris. And Thalen did a beautiful study where he, he figured it out. Bicep femoris has a slightly lower attachment point. So as the leg is swinging forward through the air, it's got a longer lever arm to fight against, so it's actually working harder. So that muscle gets strained because the bicep femoris is just situated lower. This was the vacuum phenomena that I was talking about. The acetabulum during mid-swing creates a seal in which the hip socket itself is stabilized at no metabolic cost. When you get into the late swing phase, so we're finishing up the gait cycle where the leg is just finishing through the air, that the bicep femoris muscle lengthens 9.5% during swing phase compared to 8.1 and 7.4 in semitendinosus, semimembranosus. Another important factor that we talked about before with vibration dampening, bicep femoris, in addition to storing energy that's stabilizing the pelvis, it's also dampening vibra vibration, getting ready to absorb impact forces associated with the neck, next heel strike. It has um, very long tendons that allow it to dampen vibration Extremely important muscle. I always check it for length asymmetries and for weakness patterns. Arm motions during running. Um, every runner has his own unique way of moving arms. Um, if you looked at the 2004 Women's 10K event in uh, Athens, the woman from China who won that had her arms completely at her side the entire race. Then Khalid Kanuchi set the world record in 99 in the Chicago Marathon. His hands were up by his chin. If you listen to most running experts, they will tell you there are very specific arm motions that everybody needs to have, and that the arm motions counter pelvic rotation. As the arm goes forward on one side, the pelvis is going on forward on the other, and it's you have to be doing these movements in order to provide stability. Um, in this study that, that I have here, Ponzer, um, one of the only studies ever done on the function of arm motions in walking, it's worth reading. Um, they measured oxygen, or referred to other studies that measured oxygen consumption in the hands when you ran with your arms at your side and when your arms were folded across your chest, and they showed that oxygen consumption did not vary. And then they also measured EMG activity in the anterior and posterior deltoid as people ran, and this was important there was no difference between EMG activity and the anterior and posterior deltoid. The arms acted as passive dampeners. They lessen oscillation of your head. They're just going along for the ride. You don't want to have exaggerated arm motion, but subtle asymmetries between the two sides means absolutely nothing. Look at Paula Radcliffe, world record holder in the marathon. She has an arm that comes up a little bit more, completely meaningless. Um, uh, basically, arm motions act as the vibration dampeners on Olympic bows. When you release the arrow, the bow vibrates a little bit, the dampener just uh, absorbs some of that. Um, ostriches, the most efficient um, bipeds on the planet, 
um, have no arms, and they've they've got a long neck, so they don't have to worry about dampening it. But um, arm motions just passively dampen vibration. Now you're, you're we're getting to a point where your mid your swing phase is over. You're about to hit the ground, and um, you are going to when you hit the ground have to dampen impact forces. When you hit the ground again, forces travel at 200 miles per hour. Um, you've caused the bones to vibrate at 40 cycles per second. Um, what you have to do is figure out a way to dampen some of these impact forces. Um, the best way to dampen impact force, they've looked at different ways. You can absorb it with ankle plantar flexion. You can absorb it with knee flexion. When they look at the world's fastest runners, almost all of them effectively dampen impact forces associated with their long stride lengths. Dampening in force, impact forces with short strides, no big deal. Dampening impact forces with long strides is extremely important because you're letting that leg get way in front of you and that, as it drives back, that those forces have to be absorbed. What this research showed was that posterior rotation of the pelvis, elite athletes, when that front foot hits the ground, the pelvis pulls back, allows for uh, dampening of the braking phase. Um, some people will tell you you should uh, dampen the braking phase by shortening your stride. Good runners don't have that option. That's what this slide is about. Um, good runners will select a stride length that's metabolically most efficient for them, and they have the fastest runners can have, the sprinters can have stride lengths of 11 and a half feet. They cannot afford to shorten that stride length, but if you watch the world's best runners when their foot hits the ground, the pelvis pulls back a little. That effectively dampens that 200 mile an hour, 40 cycle per second trauma that's going into the bone, um, and it's a very effective way to absorb force. And in this study, this was a great paper by Lee and Piazza. They took the world's best sprinters and compared, did measurements on uh, foot structure, compared them to um, non-sprinters. And what they found was that the world's best sprinters had toes that were a centimeter longer than um, regular uh, athletes. And they also showed, if you look at the picture on the right, the Achilles tendon in the world's best sprinters attaches 25% closer to the ankle axis. Counterintuitive because you're looking at a shorter lever arm, but again, remember what I mentioned before about gastrocnemius. When the world's best sprinters are running, their gastrocnemius isn't pumping their ankle through a large range of motion. It's isometrically tensing, letting their tendon store and return energy. It doesn't have to go through a big range of motion. By bringing it closer, you can allow a long range of motion, a large range of motion in the forefoot compared D and C. Um, and when the force is in the forefoot, the long toes give the flexor digitorum longus muscle a longer lever arm to fight against. The authors of the study were interesting because they looked in nature and they showed that cheetahs, compared to lions, cheetahs also had toes that were significantly longer and they had Achilles tendons that attach closer to the ankle axis of motion. So it's not just present in, in humans, it's present throughout nature. Give nature enough time and it will modify foot structure so that you can have um, either fast sprinters or great endurance runners. Um, the endurance runners, interestingly enough, when you look at the world's greatest endurance runners, they have small toes because that added weight is troublesome to carry around. Um, in this study, uh, getting back to sprinters, um, they wanted to figure out what makes the best sprinters, so they looked at kinematics during the gait cycle, and what they showed was that when the world's best sprinters, uh, when their lead foot hits the ground, the trail knee is farther forward, the knee is maximally flexed, the full flexion of the knee shortens the lever arm that the hip flexors have to work through to pull that trail leg forward. And what they showed was when that front foot hit the ground, that trail leg was farther forward. Um, and sprinting, what these researchers found, is that sprinting, unlike endurance running, is a learned phenomena. It doesn't come naturally. Sprinters have to constantly work on form, constantly work on subtle changes in their biomechanics. And the authors of this study said endurance runners should take a, a, a cue from that and start to figure out ways that they could have learn the techniques that sprinters use so that when they do need to achieve the faster speeds, especially at the ends of the races, they'll be able to transition into a, a sprinting form.
biomechanics of sprinting. This is a phenomenal paper. Again, I would recommend looking this up. It's 13 years old, but still one of the few papers out there that did it. He took uh, 30 um, college sprinters and evaluated them as they ran through different speeds, and they showed that the faster sprinters spend less time on the ground and generate significantly more force while they're making ground contact. Um, interestingly, fast and slow sprinters spend about the same amount of time in the air and reposition their limbs at the same rate. Um, in this study of 30 sprinters, their stride length kept increasing until it was maximized at a near full sprint. So they were at a 320 miles speed, which again, three, they're going short distances, so it's possible. Stride length was increased until they hit near full speed. Then stride length was maximized. They couldn't open it anymore. So to achieve their maximum sprinting speeds, they, in, they then increased their cadence until they hit the three minute mile pace. In all of the sprinters, the aerial um, phase of running continued to increase until the 430 mile pace, at which time it slightly decreased. A lot of experts will say they spend more time in the air. They don't. Um, they generate, they spend less time on the ground. They generate more force. And at first they open their stride length, but then they increase their cadence until maximum sprint speed was achieved. This was a study of the world's best endurance runners. This is a, a drawing I did at Tegla La Lupe. Um, uh, the world's best endurance runners, when they look at all the different anthropomorphic measurements, one of the things that stands out about them is that they plantar flex their ankles 10 degrees less during their propulsive period, and this motion occurs very quickly. So they don't move their ankle during, through a large range of motion, but it happens very fast. Again, it gets back into that concept that muscles don't act as pistons that drive legs and bones forward. They are isometrically tense at just the right time so tendons can store and return energy. In the world's best sprinters, they figure out how to do that so the ankle plantar flexion occurs at a faster velocity. Now the next um, pattern of uh, running that I'm going to talk about, so far we've talked about elites, sprinters, and um, endurance runners. What style of running should you recommend to have your patients remain injury free? Um, really important, much more important than knowing how to treat elites. Uh, one of the easiest things you can do, and again, running is less stressful on the body, recreational running is less stressful on the body than fast walking. So if you want to have a, a patient run forever, and again, you run 10 miles a week, you will live six years longer according to the research. Shorten your stride length by as little as 10% and you can reduce those impact forces by 20%. Um, a 20 percent reduction in impact forces are huge. Those, huge. those impact forces can damage bones, it can damage tendons. A 10 percent reduction in stride length is barely even noticed. And then increased cadence 5 percent over your naturally selected cadence. Um, that significantly reduces knee strain. A 10 percent increase in cadence significantly reduces stress and twisting of the hip. That study just came out in 2011, Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise. It goes against the common theory now that a lot of people are saying, pick a cadence of 180, um, count heel strikes per minute, and keep it at that. Again, everybody has a naturally selected stride. Everybody has a naturally selected cadence. So you'll want to increase your cadence over your cadence. Pick a cadence that works for you. Have your runner go out. Sometimes I'll just have them time their left heel strike. Um, left heel strike over 30 seconds, and then say 5% over that. If you're having a knee problem, 10% over it if you're having a hip problem. You also have to accommodate bony discrepancies. Um, and in order to keep a runner injury free, you have to understand their biomechanics. This was a former D1 a college runner, injured through her whole college career. Um, chronic posterior hip pain, chronic knee pain, uh, hamstring problems never went away. Um, I saw her four years after she um, got out of college. She was still trying to run, still dealing with different injuries. When she ran, she looked perfect. Her feet were going straight. Her knees were pointing in a little bit. Um, but when you did a biomechanical analysis on her, which I'll run through um, in a separate section, she had marked external tibial torsion. Um, normally, if someone's face down and knees are bent and you zoom down, the feet should parallel the thighs. If you look at that picture on the left, the average person's tibias, um, by the time they're 20 years old, have externally rotated about 22 degrees. The talus, the bone in front of the ankle, 
um, it tends to adduct or come in about 18 degrees. So the typical person should have, if you look down, about four degrees of toe out. This woman had a significant external tibial torsion and a simple test you can do. If you look at the three pictures on the right, when I have her put her feet 20 degrees out and flex her knees, they flexed in the sagittal plane, they move straight. When her feet were straight like they are when she was running, coaches emphasized that she should run with her feet straight. She read up all on it, and a lot of textbooks say you run with your feet straight. Her knees would touch each other. We had to work on gait retraining with her, simple, where we just focused on having her run with a 20 degree toe out. That's a bony discrepancy. Nothing is going to change that. That is the shape of her tibia, and if you don't accommodate it, injuries will recur. Um, and she was classic. She had quadratus femoris, hip external rotator problems, and lateral patellar compression syndrome, all from excessive internal rotation of the femur to accommodate the external rotator. Again, if this is a left foot that's turned out, when it's straight, the proximal structures are turned in. Okay, this is a, a brief exam to identify the presence of femoral antiversion and, external, and or external tibial torsion. To begin this, you want to make sure that the knees are flexing in the sagittal plane so you have proper alignment of the lower extremity. So to do that, you'll just take the knee, slowly flex it through range of motion. I'm watching it in this direction. It's moving straight. If the knee was going like this, it's internal. Like that, it's external, and it could affect this measurement. So knee and sagittal, just like that. Bring it down slowly. Hold it like that. And then while it's in this position, my thumb is on the medial malleolus, my um, indent middle finger is on the lateral malleolus, and I visually bisect the lines. I put the low bar of the goniometer so it's parallel to the table, and then I'll look, I'll line up my thumb and my middle finger, and I'll move that back and forth, and we've got an angle of 36 degrees of external tibial torsion. To identify whether or not there's femoral antiversion or not, Again, just put the legs in a neutral position, a neutral starting position. Hold your leg just like that. Then I just compare internal rotation, about 50 degrees on the right, 40, 45 degrees on the left, with external rotation. Only five or six degrees external rotation on the right, about 10 on the left. So the hips are slightly anniverted, right side more so. Um, and the tibs are externally rotated a significant amount. To double check that tibial torsion measurement, let me have you lie face down. The thigh foot angle is such that in a typical person, what you're looking at is about 18 to 20 degrees of tibial torsion. The teller neck moves in at about that same amount. So when someone's lying face down and you flex the knee, the angle of the thigh should parallel the angle of the foot. So what you should be looking at just to twist it is an angle in which there's alignment between the bottom of the foot and the thigh. With the foot and talon navicular neutral in this situation, you're looking at close to a 40 degree angle. It's a really simple way to tell if there's external tibial torsion, just like that. This combination of external tibial torsion and femoral antiversion is common and often results from a sitting position. Let me have you sit up, please. A sitting position where when kids are young, they're watching television, external torsion from the foot, internal rotation on the femur. And that's the most common cause of those two conditions occurring together. Femoral antiversion, moderately common in women and not that common in men. Um, tibial torsion, about 5% of the population has it. And in this case, we have bilateral external tibial torsion. And with the feet rotated, the degree of the torsion, notice that the knees are, flex, are pointing straight. Now let me have you bend both knees, please, and come up. Bring your feet in just a little bit more. Go out just a hair. Now bend your knees. The goal is to have the knees bend in the sagittal plane. When the knees bend in the sagittal plane, you can look at the degree of toe out. This is important for not just uh, running, because when the person runs with external tibial torsion, you have to have them run with the proper degree of toe out that allows them to flex in the sagittal plane. But other sports, such as bike riding, when they're cycling, if their feet are pointing straight, the knee will move towards the horizontal bar, causing problems. And now let me have you have both feet point straight. Look how the patellae start to point towards each other. Again, because the external, the lower tibia is externally rotated, 
when you put a foot in an apparently aligned position, it creates a malalignment of the knees. Let me have you flex, and you notice how the knees come towards each other. And come up again, now correct, go slightly out, and bend. So you want to accommodate external tibial torsion so the knees are flexing in the sagittal plane. The most important or the most common external tibial torsion, 5% of the running population has it. Femoral antiversion, not extremely common in men, very common in women. Uh, femoral antiversion can cause a gait pattern where their femurs turn in excessively, um, and that causes the patella to drift laterally. Uh, one of the main problems when you look at the effects of femoral antiversion, in the past when researchers have looked at retropatellar pain, they've always said, oh, you have a weak VMO, VMO is drifting laterally. But now some great research is showing it's not the VMO that's weak, it's the excessive inward rotation of the femur. It can happen if you don't have femoral antiversion, but you're more prone to it with femoral antiversion. And a great study came out um, in 2011, British Journal of Sports Medicine, the second one down. They wanted to correct that anaverted gait where the femur turns in, the patella shifts to the side by strengthening the hip muscles responsible for it. They gave them all these different exercises and they showed, yes, the hip muscles got stronger, in some cases 50% stronger, but it did not alter the movement during the gait cycle. You have to do more than just strengthen the muscle. You have to teach the person how to move properly. And some great research um, by Dr. Wolf shows that, and others, shows that exercising on unstable surfaces with um, gait retraining while focusing on external cues is important. You just can't tell someone, I want you to stop turning your hip in when you run. If they start thinking about it, it doesn't happen. I like drills where there's an external cue. I'll put them on an unstable surface. I'll put a, um, a cone down. I'll have them touch the cone, jump up in the air, touch the cone, jump up in the air. They can self-correct that um, internal rotation that's happening. It teaches the muscles to time themselves better. Um, partner training, where you have someone who's knowledgeable in it, run with them and say, your knee is starting to internally rotate. It's not just about strengthening. You also have to educate and retrain the neural movement patterns. Not easy. External focus on an outside cue produces significantly better changes. For now, the research is still coming out. Significantly better changes than just saying, don't do that. And at the bottom, I talk about the stability through external rotation of the femur. I'll show a little tape of a strap that it's for those tough cases that need a little proprioceptive feedback. Just a gait retraining tool, often helpful with femoral antiversion. To go through a checklist, um, you can print this up or save it. Uh, um, if you are dealing with a recreational runner who's injured, you want to make sure that they strike the ground on the outer heel. Um, it's usually more comfortable. It's metabolically more efficient. Um, a study by a researcher named Ehrlich showed that when they looked at lifelong non-injured runners, most studies look at people and then see who gets injured. This researcher was clever. He just took lifelong non-injured runners and wanted to see what made them different. They had slight and measured every anthropomorphic measurement possible. They had slightly more flexible hamstrings, but more importantly, almost all of them had excessive lateral wear on the outside of the heel. Lateral heel wear allows tibia anterior to absorb force. It allows the um, tibialis posterior to absorb force, and it's just a good shock absorber. Um, number two in this list, knees must flex in the sagittal plane. That is a simple test to do. Have an athlete stand in front of you, have them bend their knees. You, if you don't want to take the measurement to figure out if someone has external tibial torsion, you don't feel comfortable doing it, or if you're not sure if an anaverted hip is a problem, just have them bend their knees. If they have external tibial torsion, if you have them turn toe out, their knees will flex straight. If their, knees are, if their feet are straight and their knees are going towards each other, it's either the hip or external tibial torsion. Check for an anaverted hip. Either way, it has to be corrected. Sometimes it can happen with excessive pronation. If one foot pronates more than another, it can follow it in. Other times it can happen with asymmetrical weakness. Uh, One-sided weakness in one hip abductor, delayed recruitment time, can cause the leg on that side to flex in. It takes a second to find it. Um, and then if you're dealing with a recreational runner and they have chronic retropatellar pain, they're older, they have arthritis, 
have them switch to a midfoot strike pattern, or have them run with a, a relatively stiff-legged gait. We had talked about earlier hybrid running. Hybrid running doesn't have that up and low transition to the gait cycle. A relatively flat transfer of center mass, when the foot hits the ground, have them bend the knee 20 degrees and keep it stiff, just like a stiff-legged shuffle gait. Not pretty, but you can run until you're 100 with that gait. It's metabolically very efficient, easier on your body than walking. I prefer it over walking. Walking has longer strides, it's harder on the Achilles tendon. Pretty easy to learn, too. Um, and then another thing is people with histories of stress fractures should absorb force at the knees. One study showed that people who get stress fractures, especially women, have a tendency to absorb stress in the frontal plane. They drop their hip excessively, keeping the hip strong, strengthening, and gait retraining, keeping the pelvis level is um, very important. That's why number five, where I talk about keep the hips level during mid stance, essential for frontal plane stability. If one pelvis drops too much, the band pulls up on the opposite side, that can cause a problem down lower. It can also cause um, a problem where the insertion of the band gets an enthesopathy where the attachment hits it. Glute medius on that side starts to get chronically strained. Really easy to evaluate frontal plane positions of the pelvis. It's easy to see. Do a gait evaluation as they're walking towards you. You shouldn't see that pelvis move up or down. Um, and then lastly in this list, or number six in this list rather, slow runners should evaluate their most comfortable cadence. Um, if you're dealing with a knee injury, consider increasing it 5%. If you're dealing with a hip injury, increase it 10%. This is a series of uh, dynamic warm-up drills that um, I like to recommend. One, they haven't done a lot of research on them, but one study showed a 6% improvement in running endurance across three different running speeds and a 3% increase in 3K performance. I like it just to warm muscles up, improves reaction times. You can print this page up. Um, I added this study, they just did the top five uh, illustrations. I added the bottom one because the authors did not include a warm-up for the hip abductors. The grapevine running drills, in my opinion, is one of the most important warm-up drills to do. All the other ones, uh, heel hikes, hip abduction, loosens muscles up much better than a pre-exercise stretch. This is just an easy dynamic warm-up before you start to apply those loads where you've got to dampen impact forces and keep everything functioning smoothly.